Hello, welcome to our AP Biology lesson on proteins. So let me share my screen with you. So proteins, as you see here, they have this elemental composition where they contain uh, large amounts of carbon and hydrogen, but then also um, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. So in terms of their solubility, as you note, carbohydrates have equal parts oxygen to carbon, which makes them have makes them soluble in water. Because again, polarity is going to be a function of having more um, of the electronegative elements in proportion to their carbon and hydrogen. So having equal parts oxygen to carbon makes carbohydrates more soluble. Um, the if you kind of break this proportion down, you get basically eight, eight parts of this to then almost equal parts of oxygen plus nitrogen plus sulfur. They're not quite in combination as pol polar as oxygen would be, but they still have some polarity. Um, so proteins are uh, in general soluble in water. Proteins are going to be folded polymers of amino acids. And amino acids all have the same basic structure here. They're going to have a central carbon, and then they're going to have a hydrogen coming off of that central carbon. And then they're, they're going to have two functional groups that they all will have in common, the amino group and the carboxyl group. And as you remember from learning about the functional groups, the carboxyl group in solution will lose its hydrogen and thus give off a proton to make it um, to make it more acidic, but then the amino group neutralizes it as a result of taking up that extra hydrogen and therefore having this extra positive charge. So again, in solution, um, the amino acid is going to be more, um, it's going to be neutral in general. And the thing that's going to give it uh, a acidic or basic or neutral property is going to be this thing down here called the variable R group. And we'll talk about what those variable R groups are in a little bit. So again, this portion here, we're going to refer to as the backbone because when they form a chain, they're going to form a chain along here with then these R groups kind of sticking off the backbone as like ex uh, extended regions that are going to actually give the um, protein, its various properties. The polymerization of proteins happen as a result of condensation synthesis or dehydration synthesis. And what's going to happen is um, the carboxyl end and an amino end of two different amino acids are going to combine. Water is going to be lost and you're going to form an amide type group called a peptide bond. So here is a carboxyl group. Here is an amino group. So the amino groups are in yellow. The carboxyl groups are in green. And what's going to happen is a hydrogen is going to be removed from an amino group here. And then a, carbo uh, a hydroxyl group is going to be removed from the carboxyl group here. So you're going to remove that water and then you're going to form the amide group, which is N bonded to a carbonyl group and that bond right there is going to be called the peptide bond and again you can pause this to allow you enough time to go on and again it's going to have a basic property here but it's going to neutralize it on this end because it has acidic properties as well so again this portion all together is going to be referred to as the backbone and notice how the R groups are going to stick um, in directions. Oops. So the polypeptides are a chain of many amino acids joined by peptide bonds. The polypeptide is going to always have an amino end, the N end, and then a carboxyl end, a C end, and proteins will consist of one or more polypeptides. The R groups are going to have four different properties. So 
So the R groups are going to be grouped. So and that will group the, the 20 amino acids into these four groups. So you're going to have the polar neutral group, which is the second largest of the groups. And they will contain more electronegative elements in their R group. So they'll have oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. They'll have hydroxyl groups or sulfhydryl groups or amide groups. The exception that will fit in that category is tryptophan. Um, the N that's in the hydrocarbon ring gives it slight polarity. Um, the acidic group is going to have an extra carboxyl group. So it'll have the carboxyl group as part of the backbone, but it'll have an extra carboxyl group. Similarly, the basic group will have an extra amino group. And then the largest group of amino acids will be the nonpolar neutral group. And they're going to have an R group that will contain mostly carbon and hydrogen. The exception that fits in the category will be glycine, which only has hydrogen as its R group. And methionine will have an interior sulfur, so the charge is more dispersed. So even though there is a sulfur in there, it's not going to give it as much polarity, and therefore it will fit more in the nonpolar group. So if we look at each of the different amino acids, so the ones that I have colored in um, blue are going to be the basic ones. The ones in pink are going to be the acidic ones. So you can see they have the extra carboxyl group. So here's the main carboxyl group. They have the extra one here, the extra one here. So it's glutamic acid, aspartic acid. The basic ones would be histidine. So you can see it has the extra, um, the extra amino group. Um, lysine, extra amino group arginine, extra amino groups. Whereas like glutamine, this looks like it has an extra amino group, but this is an amide group, which just gives it polarity. Tryptophan, this looks like it should be basic, but because it's got um, the internal portion here, it doesn't really have enough to overcome the amount of, um, of other things around it, so they basically consider tryptophan just pol polar instead of basic. OK, again, here's another one that has an amide group, so it's just going to be polar. Then all the yellow ones are going to be nonpolar, so you can see they just have carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen. Methionine was that one exception one. Carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen. Again, not counting the backbone. The backbone is the part that's not colored in. So in terms of how these proteins actually get to where they're going to be able to uh, uh, have interactions, they need to fold up. So they start off always as a primary structure, which is just a chain that is um, linked together by the peptide bonds. But then the first level of folding is called secondary structure. And secondary structure happens as a result of hydrogen bonds between the amide group and a hydrogen bond of another amide group. So remember, the amide group is a carbonyl plus um, the amino group um, that are kind of linked together. So it's the carbon double bonded to oxygen and then um, NH that link together. So it's basically a peptide bond, which will have a polar charge, which will interact with a hydrogen of another um, amide group along the backbone. And because those occur in a regular pattern, you'll get a regular patterning of folding. So you'll either get a pattern of what's called the pleated sheet, which is kind of like a zigzag, or you'll have a uh, alpha helix, which is like a curly Q. So alpha helixes, they form more hydrogen bonds, whereas beta sheets, they form fewer hydrogen bonds. In terms of proteins you might be familiar with, silk is very rich in beta pleated sheets, whereas your hair is more um, rich in alpha helixes. So here's a picture of alpha helixes forming. So you can see what I was talking about. You have a hydrogen in the, this is all considering the backbone. So you're not paying attention to the R's yet. It's just an 
interaction between the amide groups within the backbone. Similar, there's the hydrogen bonds along the backbone. They're not counting the R groups. A tertiary and quaternary structure is where you do have interactions between R groups. So tertiary, it's R groups within a single polypeptide. Quaternary, it's R groups interacting amongst multiple polypeptides. And we'll also mention that in the formation of, of quaternary groups, oftentimes you have prosthetic groups. So if you remembered what I talked about, that you could have iron, zinc, molybdenum, and manganese. These are all going to be um, ionically bonded elements that are going to be found helping to hold the whole thing together. Um, tertiary structures are going to be formed as a result of covalent bonds, um, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and hydrophobic bonds between, uh, or hydrophobic interactions between different R groups. So covalent bonds happen between sulfhydryl and sulfhydryl groups. Hydrogen bonds happen between polar neutral groups. Ionic bonds happen between an acidic group and a basic group. And then hydrophobic interactions happen between nonpolar groups. And again, hydrophobic interactions only happen when a, a protein's actually in solution. And as this says here, a tertiary structure is the minimum folded structure to be functional. So if it loses its tertiary structure, it loses its functionality. And then finally, we have the um, quaternary groups. And as I said, it's similar, R group interactions, all the ones that we just talked about before, um, except oftentimes you have um, prosthetic groups or other, um, other things that are going to involve putting this stuff together. So like non-protein molecules that will be in there. So heme is an example of a non-protein molecule that also contains iron. So it's not just iron, but it contains a, a ring-shaped structure that holds the iron in place and that will interact with the, the four different globin proteins to make it hemoglobin. So here's a picture of hemoglobin in like a computer model -y type way. Now in terms of how those interactions happen, so here's a picture of the formation of the different interactions. So there's the sulfhydryl uh, groups interacting to form a covalent bond. This is the ionic bond. Here's a hydrogen bond. And then this is the hydrophobic interactions. So R groups need to be arranged in a particular fashion in order to carry out a function. So for example, in a protein that acts as a channel through a membrane, you might see something like this, where all of the nonpolar R groups are found in the region that will span the membrane because the tails that are nonpolar, it's going to interact in that way. And then on this side of the of the protein, you'll have different um, um, types of R groups over here, whereas you'll have different types of R groups over here, and more of them will be polar on both sides to allow it to be able to interact within the cytoplasm. Now, one of the other things, as I was saying, is being functional requires that the protein is in a three-dimensional shape, meaning the R groups are interacting. One of the ways in which a protein becomes non-functional is through what's called denaturation. Denaturation is the breakage of hydrogen bonds, and it happens as a result of either high heat or extreme pH. So when your body goes through um, and it produces a fever, what you are ultimately trying to do, because um, most of what is functional in a, a virus, for example, are proteins, you are trying to make it so that their viral proteins become non-functional by producing the, the fever. Um, again, an extreme pH, generally we are trying to maintain our pH within a range of 7.2 to 7.6 your body naturally can do that. You don't need to um, adjust your diet to, to do that. Your, your body can do it like your liver and other parts of your body 
perform that task um, without you aiding them. Um, so ultimately you can, uh, you want to maintain those things. So your body doesn't ever really uh, affect your pH because again, fever is going to affect you, but your body can actually increase the temperature of your blood while, whereas, you know, kind of keeping that away from your, the blood away from your brain a little bit. So it's not affecting your brain proteins. So, and it should be noted that denaturation is usually reversible. So meaning once it has happened, it can actually reform back in to the correct shape um, after the heat has, uh, has occurred. Okay, so that is all for our lesson on proteins.